Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, my name's uh, Miraj Ahmed. I'm uh, co-unit master of Diploma One. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Haroon Mirza, who's um, here tonight to give this lecture uh, about his work. Um, Haroon has won many international um, awards, basically. He's, he's a, a, a great artist, I would say. Um, and um, his work tests the relationship between sound, light waves, electric current. Um, and there is a kind of alchemy in the way he combines a, a variety of ready-made and time-based materials uh, to create audio compositions, which are often performative, site-specific installations and kinetic sculptures that, that engage uh, with the architecture of a space. But also, they're visceral and uh, synesthetic, um, overlapping, overlapping our senses, overlapping our kind of sense of a space. Um, his, uh, uh, Haroon's ex exhibitions and awards, are, uh, are, are both locally and abroad, are numerous. Just to name a few, he was recipient of the Nam June Pike Art Center Prize and Zurich Art Prize in 2014, and the Daiwa Foundation Art Prize in 2012, the Northern Art Prize in 2011, and finally he was awarded the, the Silver Lion at the uh, 2001 Venice Biennale. We in Diploma One have been quite fortunate um, in that um, uh, Haroon came and um, collaborated with us on our project, um, looking at uh, parts of East London and looking at it through the lens of an artist, actually looking at, uh, looking at the city artistically. And this overlap between art and architecture in the making of cities is something that we, we're very interested in. I think that, that um, it, it's something that Haroon's also interested in. Um, and uh, we wanted to kind of share that, I mean, as a unit master, um, we kind of bring people in, but I thought actually it would be great to share Haroon with the rest of the school. Um, so over to you, Haroon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay, so can everyone hear? That's quite loud. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Mirage. It's really nice to be um, back, actually, because I was already here working with some of the students with Mirage. And... Um, so thank you for all coming, and uh, it's yeah, it's nice to um, talk about my work in this context because it's slightly different from uh, speaking at an art school or, uh, or art-related um, events and context. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm just going to um, break this down into a few sort of parts. I'm going to um, I've got I'm not texting. I've got some notes here on my phone, so I'm just going to look at this every now and again. Um, so I'm going to sort of give you a sort of brief theoretical um, introduction to my work or context, um, sort of the ideas that underpin my practice. Then I'm going to um, go through um, some works uh, on the screen and, and talk about the actual work itself. Um, which will mainly be images that can the images can just scroll in the background, but I'll show you some videos, which is a which is a bit more um, representative, I guess, of of the work. Um, and then I guess I you know prefer to um, open it up and you know open up for questions and um, have a conversation. Um, but also any point, um, you know, feel free to uh, say stuff. I know you probably won't, but. Please do, if there is something that springs to mind. Um, so, um, this is an image. So I've got some images that sort of talk about the context. So this is an image that was on my, oh, it's probably still in my website. I've got, a, my website is an archive now from 2003 to 2013 of work that I made over that 10 years. <clears throat> and this image was on the homepage for a long time because I think it sort of, um, uh, is a good representation of what my work is, which is um, Verez meets Duchamp. So I'm sure you all know who Duchamp is, the creator of the ready-made, which I'll talk about a little later, um, who proposed the idea of the ready-made. And then there's Edgar Verez, who's sort of less known, but still quite well known, who um, was a composer, uh, an avant-garde composer, who kind of pushed the limits of what was... Um, what was allowed in the in in chamber music, um, or what could be music, 
what could be chamber music. Um, so this, I guess this um, image also sort of represents this idea of, um, or my interest in the sort of visual and acoustic perception of space. Um, so the visual uh, being influenced by Duchamp and the acoustic mainly influenced by Varese. Um, so this idea, that's a tiny image, that this idea is um, sort of um, kind of really well represented in uh, the last one trio film, Dancer in the Dark, uh, in which Bjork plays, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the film, has anyone seen the film? So Bjork plays this um, character, Selma, who's, um, who's a factory worker, and she, uh, she slowly goes blind and as she goes blind, she's got this kind of fantasy about being in a musical. She's into sort of West End musicals or, you know, uh, Broadwalk, Broadway musicals. And um, so she has this sort of fantasy. And as she's going blind, the sort of factory, all the sounds of the everyday become, become music. Um, so all the factory noises become sort of rhythmic sounds and then other other um, other sounds become really musical. And she basically, um, you know, fantasizes that as, as music and she starts dancing, you know, and becoming this sort of, this sort of character in this, in this fantasy. Um, so this kind of led to this um, idea of, uh, you know, I was starting to get interested in between this relationship between um, visual and acoustic space and thinking about the distinctions between hearing and listening, or sorry, hearing and seeing. Hearing and listening was another thing, but anyway, um, but the distinctions between seeing and hearing, but actually also the distinctions between hearing, listening, um, the distinctions between sound, music, and noise, and what these sort of things are. Um, and when I was thinking about seeing and hearing the difference between those, I realized that actually we, um, the Western civilization is really ocular centric, which means that, um, uh, we're, we're kind of more, uh, we give more prominence to sight than, uh, vision than to hearing. So, um, visual space is of more sort of significance and there's, there's, it's kind of, um, there's a sort of um, um, idea that seeing is more important, basically. We favor vis vision than uh, uh, as opposed to listening. And um, this was kind of uh, described, I mean, I got this sort of idea of uh, this through McLuhan. So McLuhan's here on, on the right in Annie Hall, talking to Woody Allen, um, he did this guest appearance at the height of his at the height of his fame as a as a media researcher. The, I mean, he's a godfather of media studies. In case you in case you don't know his work, and so he suggested that um, he suggested that um, in his essay, Acoustic Space, he was uh, suggesting that the West is, or Western civilization is, is ocular centric. And that um, there was two moments of, um, uh, two mo he, he believed that before, before, at a certain point in history, mankind was um, uh, uh, perceived the world, like listening and hearing, uh, sorry, listening and seeing were one perceptual mode. Um, and he thinks that when, with linguistic man, there was like a burfication, there was a split between listening and uh, uh, seeing and listening. So when we assigned words to objects, so when, when uh, somebody named this object a tree, that was like a phonetic sound that was created to represent an object. And at that moment, a sound represented uh, an object which was a visual thing, there was like a split between those two things. Um, and then later on, it got even more, sep the, the separation became even wider when uh, Gutenberg here 
um, invented the the printing press. So when so you've got this you've got this word tree, um, but when it becomes syntax, when it becomes graphic form, it's it's going back to graphic form. Um, so it's going from an object, a visual thing, to a sound, a sonic thing, and then that sound is being represented by a graphic thing, which is com more abstract from the thing itself. So he thinks that sort of pushed things further. Um, but then I, I was thinking when I was, when I was doing this research, which is a long time ago now, so it's kind of a bit weird to still be talking about it. Um, I was thinking that actually the, um, the fine arts had something to do with it as well, because um, uh, painting and sculpture were sort of regarded, it, they were pushed by the church, something that Ronsier calls the um, uh, uh, religious regime of art. They were pushed by the Catholic church, and in, in, uh, in, this is mainly in Western civilization, as um, things of great significance. So there's this idea of high art, and art became uh, sort of really uh, elevated to a kind of, kind of a, to an extreme point where it became part of what Marx would call the superstructure. You know, so you've got an economic base, you've got, uh, what is it, base, structure, and superstructure, right? So it was up there with the gods. Um, and because this was generally, the high arts were generally visual, I mean, there was chamber music, however, uh, not everyone had access to chamber music. It was only the elite and the rich that could um, go and listen to uh, chamber music, the high art form of music. Um, everyone else would listen to minstrels or, you know, they would sort of make their own songs and, and whatnot. Um, so this, so I believe that this um, sort of idea of high art um, had a lot to do with ocular centrism as well. So the West, the Western civilization favoring the eye over the air. Um, and this, there was a turning point for this uh, with Duchamp. So Duchamp, who um, presented the ready-made, which opens up uh, so many things in terms of art and culture and, and working with objects. Uh, we can talk about that more later again. But he also um, presented this idea, or, pro or proposed this idea of the reverse ready-made, which I think is more of an in is, is, is a more interesting idea, more important, um, where he used an example of using taking a Rembrandt off the wall and using it as an ironing board. So rather than uh, you know an object becomes an artwork, it's the, the complete opposite. Um, and this was kind of, um, I mean, he never did this much, but it was kind of illustrated in his portrait of um, the Mona Lisa with a, with a moustache um, and other graffiti. So, um, so with Duchamp um, and sort of post-structuralist thinking, French thinking, this sort of, um, this sort of resistance to um, ocular, centrism, sort of, ocular centrism emerged, uh, which was also a sort of anti-capitalist um, stance. And that kind of led on through many different forms and arguments and, and uh, sort of theories to uh, the idea of uh, detourment from Guy Debord uh, when he was uh, with the Letterist International. Uh, and later this was adopted by the Situationists. Um, so detourment, uh, I guess you guys probably know about this, is this idea of hijacking and rerouting. And it was generally, generally used in sort of slogans and logos where they would uh, change the sort of meaning of, of graphic design, but more the function of it. So it's this kind of, this is why it relates to the ready-made, um, because it's taking, the, taking something and changing the function of it or removing the function of it. Um, and it was mostly sort of, uh, notably sort of um, anti-capitalist, these, these sort of ideas. But it was also expanded into sort of architecture and space, and Henry de Ferve would talk about it as a, as a spatial practice. And he spoke about, um, in his book, uh, Production of Space, he talked about um, um, how, you know, he uses Le Halles as an example in Paris, 
how uh, that space was literally reprogrammed by people inhabiting that space. And they kind of took it on and kind of completely changed the way it functioned. And it's interesting now what's happened there as well, because it's kind of been taken back by the government and they've, you know, built this huge train station and sort of, you know, originally it was like a market um, where you'd get like fresh foods and stuff. And now it's this sort of shopping mall. I guess it is becoming a market again of, of sorts, but it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it's been taken back. Um, and this idea, uh, so th these sort of, these, these ideas of uh, uh, detournment and the reverse ready-made and, um, and uh, appropriation, Lefebvre talks about appropriation as well, and he makes a distinction between appropriation and, and um, detournment as, as uh, to say that Appropriation is when you sort of kind of uh, mankind takes nature and appropriates it and and and, and sort of um, modifies it for its own needs, you know. Um, whereas detourment is more of an organic thing that it's a symbiotic relationship and it's 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 using existing things to kind of um, uh, to change the function of them. Uh, so, so appropriation he sort of regarded as sort of quite invasive and aggressive, whereas the torment was more, um, more organic. Um, so anyway, so these are, and I, and I wanted to talk about this particularly, this, I mean, there's other things that kind of, uh, I'm interested in, especially in the work that I'm doing now, uh, but these ideas are the sort of basis for it. And I wanted to talk about these things because they, I guess they related more to architecture in, in, in some way. Um, my work often sort of um, uh, goes into art. So I, I, I work in many different sort of uh, ways and media and um, methodology, apply many different methodology to the way I work. Um, and it, uh, it often goes through like, various different sort of contexts to, you know, I mean, predominantly art and gallery, sh gallery shows, you know, art museums and gallery shows, but also um, music. So uh, because of the work itself, because of the nature of the work, I do a lot of things that are in the context of music. So either, either you know, from anything from nightclubs to opera houses. Um, and... Uh, and then sort of architectural projects as well, because sometimes I would, I would build structures because, it's, because my work is mainly about space and kind of changing space and, and creating environments. Um, so sometimes controlling the space is, is a big part of it, where the space becomes part of the work, like a ready-made, or even building, to going to an extreme to building structures to, to house uh, certain uh, works, but they're not, you know, the, the structures are the work as well. So I'm going to sort of scroll through these things um, very briefly. Let me just put these on sort of uh, rotation. How do you do that? Slideshow. Um, so, um, so one of the general things that I do, or my methodology, is to uh, basically uh, work with electricity and take electricity and um, uh, and sort of visualize it through lighting like you're seeing here LED lighting but then also at the same time amplifying it so you can hear it so um, what ends up happening is that you have this uh, material electricity and you can see it and hear it at the same time simultaneously um, so these this becomes, uh, this, I guess there's three types of work, one or four types of work, let's say. Um, one is um, these sculptures, these discrete objects that kind of do things, sometimes kinetic, and have lighting on them, and, uh, and sort of place sound. You know, they, they have sound emitting from them, which is structured and layered to create sort of complex audio patterns, could be perceived as music could be perceived as noise, depending how you sort of look at it or listen to it. Oh, it just crashed. Uh, um, and um, it's probably like a dodgy image in there somewhere. 
Um, and um, so, yeah, uh, the, the, the sounds are layered and they could be perceived as music. And then there's um, other works that are kind of room-sized installations. So we're, I was saying where the, where the space becomes part of the, part of the work as a ready-made and it becomes uh, um, an environment. And then there's like structures um, that, are, that are built specially for the installations. So an example of that is sort of here, I guess. This is a, this is a room, I mean, it's a, quite a basic room. It's just a square room with a wooden floor and a soft ceiling, but it's, it's, you know, it's created for the work to be installed in. Um, there's also this other body of work, which are kind of discrete ob wall-based objects that are kind of experiment. These are uh, uh, sort of more recent works that are um, working with solar, solar energy and solar panels, um, which become musical works as well. So these are, th this, this piece is called, uh, it's part of the Solar Symphony series. So essentially the sun uh, generates electricity, which is then emitted as light and sound, and, it's, and then it's, um, uh, it's heard. But the sun decides how it's played, essentially. So, so the sun plays the music. It's another solar symphony. And then, um, and then a lot of my work is also collaborative. So for instance, this installation made up of these three parts, um, this is a video uh, made by or shot by Jeremy Della, the artist Jeremy Della. Um, so this is incorporated into this installation. And this is a film, an expanded cinema film from the 70s by Guy Sherwin that's also incorporated into this installation. And they all kind of work together. Um, so this is, yeah, more solar symphonies. And these were the first solar symphony works that I made that were shown in Villa Savoie in Poissy. I'm sure you're all familiar with the house. Um, maybe I can talk a little bit about that because there was at one point the house was called the light. Uh, what was it called? I've forgotten the name of it. Does anyone know the name of Villa Safar that the family call, called it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was hoping in an architecture school someone might. Uh, anyway, uh, it was called the light something. Uh, but this sh show was called the light hours because it was based on the sort of trajectory of the sun uh, in the house. Um, you know, one of the constraints of working in a, uh, in a house like that, especially in France when it's a national monument, was that I couldn't touch anything. And work, you know, it was, I couldn't even plug things in. So um, it was, it was, we were barely allowed to um, touch the floor. So, um, so the idea was to make works that kind of stand alone. And this was my first time, that, this is the first time I worked with solar, solar panels. And, um, and um, so um, as these generate sound, depending on the sun, as, they, as the sun passed through the house, the, the sort of house was almost like a big instrument and the sound changed throughout the day um, and was sort of, com you know, uh, composed by the sort of, uh, uh, the uh, different types of light that would enter the house. Um, they hated it actually in the house. I think they were really annoyed. And, um, and actually a lot of architecture students came and hated it as well because they were like, we want to see the house. We don't want to <laughs> see these objects with this odd sound. So sorry to anyone that might have gone there and hated it. Um, so, um, yeah, that was more of an example of uh, working with the context of a, of a space rather than um, the actual space itself physically. Um, so these are more sort of objects. Um, so this, this is a structure uh, which is a sort of based on an anechoic chamber. And this is a work that was shown in the uh, Venice Biennale. And it was uh, basically a, a space, a triangular, an equilateral triangle, which you walk into and both uh, your your vision and your uh, hearing is limited, so it's a completely pitch black space with with uh, acoustic foam everywhere to um, limit those senses. And then um, at some point, this halo of light appears 
in the in the ceiling. There's a video of it. I can show you that in a second. Um, that um, that um, slowly gets brighter and brighter, and as 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 that happens, you hear the sound of the electricity, and that gets louder and louder, and then it disappears, and you're left with kind of tinnitus and dots in your eyes, and uh, there's a sort of a weird perceptual thing that happens. Um, some more acoustic foam, some more sort of assemblages. This is um, a work that was looking at um, sort of typical architectural features in galleries. I got, I got obsessed with the history or the typology of the shadow gap and where that came from. Um, so was exposing all these sort of um, types of... Um, um, there's a, um, the gallery that I work with, Listen Gallery, there's a funny anecdote. Uh, the owner of it, uh, Nicholas Logsdale, uh, which, uh, you know, Mirage, he, uh, I don't know if you know this, but he claims he invented the shadow gap. Him and him and uh, Tony Fretton. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I don't know how true that is, but anyway. He said that he wanted the gallery to hover. Yeah, every architect. Oh, there we go again, it's gone. Um, so maybe I'll just show you some video now because it's, uh, that's the roof of that. So this is how the uh, pavilion looked from outside in Venice. I'm gonna, yeah, sh show some video so you can hear the work as well. I mean, it's really hard to, um, uh, this, it's difficult to uh, present this work because you kind of have to be there. Uh, so here's the, a pavilion that I was just talking about. So this was called the National A Pavilion of Then and Now. So that's kind of all it does with a sort of 30 second gap in between. In many ways, it's the most minimal work I've ever made. Um, and then um, here's, I guess, uh, let's do this one first. So this is an example of a, like a sort of standalone sculpture. I think where uh, at a moment where the works are becoming more recognizable as music and there was that relationship to um, electronic music because um, these processes I use are completely I mean no different to early electronic instruments and synthesizers um, so the amplification of electricity is what early synthesizers were doing this is more um, spatial, so this is working with the space a bit more. This is called Falling Rope, and it was in uh, a bathhouse in Japan. It's kind of, in the installation, there's references to bathhouses, but I won't go into that. Yeah. 
hearing the electricity just turning on and off. fading like going from dim very like from off to bright bright full brightness which is using a digital process called pulse whip modulation which is also um, a process that early synthesizers used so it's turning the electricity on and off so fast that it sounds like a, 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 a tone a buzzing sound footage of a waterfall um, and also hear the waterfall as, the, as you see the image um, a waterfall sounds like white noise there was a um, an anecdote by this artist called Max Newhouse who noted that the, the, a waterfall and um, a motorway from a certain distance sound the, sound the same and yet we want to live near a waterfall and live far away from a motorway and um, so I realised this was actually just white noise he was talking about. Um, white noise was also used in synthesizers, uh, or, you know, uh, sort of, yeah, noise was used in synthesizers to uh, represent a hi-hat in drums. Um, <clears throat> here's um, an example of uh, where a work occupies both a space. I mean, so this is a building on the 33rd floor. This is the 33rd floor of a building on Times Square. Um, and this uh, project, it was a collaboration with two other artists, Ed Atkins and James Richards. And um, so we occupied this space on Times Square and also um, two of the large screens, the, the big Toshiba screens that are up there. So we had video footage on there, and there's a sort of installation by Max Newhouse, uh, the artist that I just mentioned a minute ago, um, which is um, sort of embedded in, in, in the underground in, in, in Times Square. And that uh, is a drone. It's been, it's been there since the 80s, I think. It's a DIA Foundation sort of permanent installation. If you don't know it's there, you'll never notice it. But if, if you know it's there, you, you kind of hear it. Um, so it incorporates all these things. And it was like a performative uh, thing that ran for four nights. So this is a very, it was like half an hour long. Uh, but this is a short edit. You get a sense of it, perhaps. That's the interference of an energy saving light bulb on transistor radios that buzzing sound. Again. There are two technologies that never coexisted because as uh, energy saving light bulbs came out, transistor radios were outmoded and replaced by digital radios.
of time played a big part in the sort of thing. Um, so a little later, this work kind of found itself in another work, or reference to this work found itself in another work, which was a commission by Channel 4, uh, part of the random, uh, what's it called? Random Act series, um, where, you, uh, where you artists are invited to uh, make a three-minute film just within their advertising, you know, yeah, a three-minute film be be between their normal programming. And uh, so this also refers to the idea of detournment in, in some sense, where I kind of hijacked the actual advert that was due to be playing. Not the advert, it was the, um, what's it called when the Channel, f channel 4, like, logo thing, yeah, so, what's it? In Ident, exactly, yeah, yeah, the Channel 4 Ident. Um, and the sort of premise for this is also based on, so this idea of time and, and, and um, uh, traveling through time and ontology, the uh, Derrida's idea of ontology, um, it comes from uh, this uh, strange transmission that my sister and I saw when we were kids um, back in the 80s. We were watching television and the TV went funny and, and there was something that claimed to be a message from the future. And... Um, and then it sort of disappeared and we never heard about it again, never knew what it was and nobody else ever saw it, apparently. And um, uh, so my idea when I was commissioned to make this was actually that was a message to me from myself. So um, I convinced myself that was the case and I asked Channel 4, um, well, I, I said to Channel 4 that I'd make this film on, on, the, on the basis that they transmit the message to 1987 and um they said yes so um i made the little clip and uh this is this is what it was <laughs> TVs were a different format back then, so you to resize it. This is a transmission from the future. It's 2012. Things are very different and yet the same. Our technology has advanced greatly and is developing at an increasing rate. The population has exceeded the 7 billion mark and the planet is transforming as a result. The political state of the world is in a constant state of flux. The West is losing power to the East, and the world economy is a system that is under a great deal of scrutiny. It seems we're taking control of our own evolution, but also realize that we need to keep nature on our side. The climate is changing incredibly quickly. Agriculture is now a very sophisticated technology, and yet millions remain hungry. We live in a time of economic and agricultural warfare. We're not sending you history 
history the 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 history history we're not sending you this message to change the course of history the history 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 I think we can stop there. Um, it was another. Oh, there's one more. This was just where um, how um, uh, another. This was a recent project at the Paris Opera uh, with a choreographer called Wayne McGregor. It's. I mean, this was only shot on my iPhone, but it's. Uh, they've got this ceiling. Um, uh, the the dome in the in the in the auditorium is a Chagall painting. Um, so I in, I sort of reinstalled their lights. <laughs> I guess I wanted to show this just to uh, talk about um, the appropriation or the, the tournament or the space. Anyway, yeah, um, let's have some questions maybe. Thanks, Haroon. Um, I've got the microphone, so I'm going to pass this around. But before I pass it around, um, thank you. I mean, it's a, I, one thing I um, am interested in is the way that you're quite interested in the function of things or the way things work. Yeah. And um, it seems that, I mean, it kind of goes back to the tournament. And, but how um, something so, I mean, because like you've got a set of tools, and I think, I mean, it goes back to the idea of the electricity and the way that there's this kind of binary of, of switching something on and off. And whether that's something that is a sort of, I don't know, it, it's a kind of really basic thing, but whether that's something that allows, is that something that you you're, you use to kind of read space or read things in order to kind of make the detournment? If you know what I mean. What, turning things on and off? Yeah, as a, as a kind of like a methodology. I mean, it's just a sort of an observation. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, I haven't really thought about it in, in a... Yeah, I guess. I think it's... I think um, on and off is a binary thing. It's, oh. you know, it's kind of opposition as well. Yeah. So, yeah, the idea of swapping the function... You know, the idea of the ready-made is removing its function oh. or completely reversing its function or remo yeah so um yeah i guess there is that um that could be sort of um you could read into it like mm, that I, I mean because um it, it, i was lucky enough to go to the uh the, the um the um union chapel uh installation that you did mm. just before christmas and i i was just struck by the way that the the, the space sort of Activate. It was kind of binary. It kind of activated mm. itself, and it switched itself off. You sort of. It was kind of orchestrated in that kind of manner. I think that that. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it. Yeah. I think this because I mean I often think about um, binary as the sort of um, as a whole rather than two different things. I think I think binary is a is a whole or made up of two things. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, even, even graphically, or in, in terms of the syntax of it, you know, you've got a one and a zero. Yeah. The zero represents infinite and the one represents finite, yeah. you know. So um, I'm interested in how these two things work in, 
opposition to each other together and and you know and in solitude mm. um and i get and i guess it's just a it's just a sort of uh uh it comes from a sort of i guess a polytheistic worldview of of poly, you know dualism or something mm -hmm. you know before i hog the microphone can i i'm going to pass this around Hi. Does the your idea for sound come first, and then you stage the sound in a way? Or I know that the sound is also a byproduct of the material electricity itself, but you still need to decide at the first: is it the exploration for the beat, or for the sound, for the frequency of that electricity, or is it coming more from the appropriation and detournement of the space, uh, and then deciding on a material, a screen, lights, whatever? It actually changes every time. Sometimes it might be, um, sometimes it might be a process or like something that I've discovered in the studio by accident or by sheer determination, um, or it might be, yeah. So it might be a, a sound or a way of creating a sound. It might be, um, uh, it might be a, it might be an idea or uh, something that I've seen. Um, it's ne it's it's not it's usually not one thing. I guess that's the answer that I'm um, uh, looking for, um, and it can be a number of different things, and it often it you know it often changes. So, um, uh, but I but uh, like Mirage was saying, there's a set of tools that perhaps I I have developed and continue to develop, which which um, is like a vocabulary that kind of sort of keeps growing and evolving um and then you can kind of pick and choose out of those things what the sort of beginning is you know um yeah it's hard to say you know f like for now I, I don't know like there's one work in the studio that the the the, the, the starting point is growing plants <laughs> you know and then then it evolves from that um or um i don't know uh um, say for this Times Square a, a sort of installation, the starting point was Times Square itself, you know, uh, and, and the sort of history of that that place. So it, it does change and it's never, yeah, it's never the same. Sometimes it is, you know. It's nice kind of, to know that it's, uh, site specific or yeah, well, when it's something site spe specific, if someone's asked, invited me to do something in a space, then I often go to the space, you know, and kind of check it out, look at all the sort of architectural features, you know, check the acoustics, um, and then that where that space is and what's the history of that place. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that um, become, that feed into the work. And I guess, you know, it's a, it's, it's kind of a normal thing to do for anyone, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're asked to do something, you know, like, I don't know, as a, as a, as an architect, you, you know, at this, you always start start with the site, you know. So so it's like uh, so um, and and for me also and and for a lot of you know artists actually, a site visit is the first sort of mm. thing that happens. Um, but with you with the um, uh, Villa Savoie, you you kind of shut down your senses. Oh yeah. So with the Villa Savoie, yeah. I um I never I've never seen the the building because every time I went there, I blindfolded myself because. Um, so there was two parts to, I mean, there's two reasons why I did that. One was because uh, I wanted to install this show completely acoustically, so I wasn't interested in um, uh, the aesthetic of how something looked. I mean, I was interested in that, but that would be a result of how it sounded in the space. And so I could, uh, I could, I could tell where light, because I was using solar panels, I could tell where the light was and how the space visually worked in terms of light completely through the work. Um, so that was one reason for doing it. The other reason was um, kind of a quasi-political reason. And it, again, this idea of ocular centrism, um, so it was a kind of a resistance to that. And, um, and also this idea of cultural capital, so um, this, this notion that somehow if you've seen something, it's really important, you know, so to go to Villa Savoie, you, know, you, you always say, oh, I've seen that house, you know, I've been to that house, I've seen it. But that's not what experience is. Experience isn't just about seeing something. Um, 
so it was kind of this, yeah, resistance to cap cultural capitalism and ocular centrism. How do you know when a work is finished? Um, it's, it's sometimes hard to know. I actually, I, unlike other artists, I'm quite good at knowing <laughs> knowing when it's done. It just um, there's a um, yeah. Well, the, the the good thing about what my sort of endeavour is for for that question in relation to that question is that. Um, a lot of my work tries to be irreducible, so I try to make the work irreducible. So whatever's there is only the, the things that are necessary for it to work as a as a whole. So um, so there's two parts to that. One is that um, uh, it's it's kind of um, the mechanics of it are always kind of not always, but a lot of the time revealed. You know, you can see how things work. There's no sort of uh, it's not it's demystified. Um, and the other is that it's um, it's uh, sort of uh, straightforward, like easy to make. So, um, yeah, I kind of, yeah, I'm kind of good at knowing when things are finished. It's just when uh, when everything works somehow, you know, uh, technically more than, you know, this visual thing. I mean, there is a visual thing that comes into it, and that's like, I find that a problem. I find that as a a bit of a pain in the ass, you know, like, oh, something has to look a certain way. But what, you know, what is that? That's just a, it's just a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a result of conditioning or, um, uh, in, you know, product of influence. Yeah, again, it's all those things, you know, uh, are never the same. Um, but mainly um, everyday things, you know, things that I'm, things that I'm seeing or hearing on a daily basis. The most kind of immediate things are, are the ones that I'm most attracted to, um, and that might lead to other kinds of research and looking into things. But it's, uh, I mean, I, sh I mean, this I didn't show many kind of. Because I saw Video that you elements. have one project that you did a couple of years ago with, for example, Carl Cox. Yeah, so right. So this been okay. more influenced, I guess, like with the techno music, house music. Yeah. Because I get this music is directly created with the technology, so like the computer programs and like mixing yeah. tables. Yeah, So I was sure. wondering if that's like more related to your projects. So yeah, what? totally. I and mean, that work in particular, I think, if I, if it's the one that you're thinking, where, where did you see it? I just saw one video that you had for the Tate. Uh, One interview that they did. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that sculpture, you know, on on the face of that, the Carl Cox reference really comes from Carl Cox's head, like his face, and that's just from a record that was, you know, I had a number of those that same record, so I had loads of these sleeves. So yeah, um, you know, I had that. I mean, I had that record originally when it came out because I, I was into the record, and then uh, I la later made a work out of the record itself because it was like. <laughs> it's like three different colored vinyl, right? And I made like a thing out of it. So um, I got more of these records because I started working with the actual records themselves. Um, so I had loads of these sleeves lying around. So it's, you know, it's it's there. It's like part of the everyday, but it's also part of my, you know, um, yeah, 90s uh, sort of, <laughs> yeah, going out stuff, you know? Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, the, the interesting thing is that you always um, refer to this ocular centristic kind of way of working, yet you always introduce light back into it. So obviously bring it back to the visual and make the unseen all of a sudden visible. So in a way you start reversing the whole process again. Well, yeah, well, I, I'm, yeah. I'm more interested in, I'm not like, it's not about, it's more like simultaneous, like they, they, they're, they're of, there's no hierarchy between them. They're of equal value. So, um, I mean, if I was, if I was trying to, um, I guess if my endeavor was to make hearing more, you know, 
important or give it more significance, then I'd be just working with sound. But I'm, that's not my endeavor. It's to make things more balanced and more equal. So the idea is that, you know, electricity can be seen and heard at the same time simultaneously. So that's the, that's the, that's the kind of key, I think, that it's, um, it's both. It's not just one or the other. Hi. Um, you, you recently, using a, a lot of, I don't know, using a, a sort of a very visual analog process, you recently made and put out a record, right? Yeah, right. Um, which I guess is itself very ripe for sort of being reinterpreted, appropriated, whatever, by other people. Is that something that you're kind of consciously interested in doing in your work, making yourself, um, you know, allowing yourself to be appropriated by others? Yeah, sure, because I do that and, myself. And, sorry, and has, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, and has that been an influence on your work? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think um, appropriation, well, more reappropriation is is um, kind of vital for sort of artistic practice. And I think also a, a true creative uh, form or um, event or two creativity doesn't come out of one person. It always comes out of more than like a collaborative thing. It's this binary thing again. So I think coll collaboration is more interesting as a as a process, and I think you can get better results from working with other people. Um, and um, yeah, so I often appro appropriate or reappropriate, you know, like artworks and sounds and video from all over the place. From I don't know, from you know, buildings and structures like I've talking about, spoken about, or or, or like artworks like. I mean, one work, there was an image of it earlier of, uh, that incorporates a, 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 mi a mirror, um, a convex mirror by, um, oh, sorry, a concave mirror by Anish Kapoor. Um, and the works like with uh, Jeremy Della. And then collaborations with musicians. And so, yeah, very much so. The idea with that record is that it's, it's, a, it's a tool. It goes back to kind of scratch tool, you know, DJ tools, um, scratch tools and battle mix tools that can uh, can be um can be used by others and and you know actually when that record w was released somebody emailed the studio asking if they could sample it and it was like a crazy question because that's what it's there you know that's what it's for um so yeah it's yeah it's a lot about that and you know it was i'd never released records before never really uh, recorded music until recently because um because it was it was it was strange to have something that's just acoustic, uh, but those those sounds come from a, sort of a very visual thing. So it was kind of, it kind of made sense to do it this time. All oh, right, cheers. <laughs> Uh, just an another point I wanted to, the word alchemy, because I really like that word. I'm a great fan of alchemy. Uh, and I kind of see that within your your work, there's a kind of process uh, where everything is sort of, where the idea that, that a, a kind of basic thing or uh, uh, an ordinary thing has another life. And it seems that you want to kind of extract that and then sort of put it out there. I'm just wondering how, um, as things get more sophisticated, in terms of you know how you how you manipulate that you you do is there a point where you go oh that I've gone too far overproduced yeah, or all yeah. the time yeah yeah because I think there's this there's this tendency in in certainly in contemporary art and well most mm. things but you know I think it's going back again now things are changing mm. Mm. where things have to be sort of highly produced and you know mm. kind of you know it's it's um, it's it's often well it's m m it's more so that artists don't make their own work, mm. you know, that don't touch mm. the things that they make. Um, and I think that's kind of a bit crazy. I mean, it might be a problem for me because in a way, I, someone said, the, I can't remember, oh, it was in a show, this guy mm. criticizing this very thing. And he was talking about, um, you know, the art world and, uh, and actually it's an industry. People call it the art world, but it's actually an industry like any other industry, mm. right? Um, and uh, um, he and he was basically saying, oh, the less the artist touches the work, the more valuable mm. it becomes, mm. you know, which is a which is a sort of a crazy thing. And um, and I and you know, so in a way, I f with that idea, I'm, I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot because you know, it's um, 
it, it's, it's always a struggle to make work in the first place and then to kind of fund that as well, it's, 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 a, it's a problem. But, um, but you're, you know, you're absolutely right, and I think things are changing again now as well, um, where you know, discoveries happen through, through a process of alchemy. Um, and, and sort of this idea of, what, you know, the idea of magic mm. comes from very similar sort of, uh, 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 very similar basis, and, and that's, the, that's the thing. Things can be completely demystified and still be magical. Mm. And, I, and I guess that's what um, Walter Benjamin t talked to, called, you know, he, he described that as the aura of an artwork. Mm. Um, you know, he talked about that in, in, the, in the, what's it, in, uh, in art, uh, what is it, the age of mechanical reproduction. Mm. Yeah, art in the is it art in the age of mechanical? Yes. Anyway, uh, yeah. But I mean, I think <laughs> that, that 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 you seem to be able to you've got a, a good grasp of that because I think that um, that that idea that something can transform, but then your your kind of the the humour in the transformation seems to be really present in your work. That the the idea that um, that a rock can make a sound if the sun speaks to it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I think uh, is is very poetic, and I think that um, that's that's what I mean. Is that that there's a sort of um, a sleight of hand that I think is quite, yeah. quite interesting. I mean, it's really important to me because it's the only it's the only moment where um, you can I can learn something myself about the you know yeah. about making or, or or something. You know, I learn I learn something when I'm when I'm making stuff. It's the kind of tinkering. Yeah, the tinkering. Yeah. yeah. It's like, a, yeah, and discovery. It's about a discovery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I Anyone else? Yeah. Eager to ask questions. Yeah. Well, maybe this is a <laughs> moment to, <laughs> yeah. to sort of say thank you and bring it to a close. But it's been really great. Cheers. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.